Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. With a more transmissible COVID-19 variant spreading, new measures may be in store. All options are on the table. Possible travel restrictions and the damage the variant is doing in long-term care. What was really happening behind the scenes in the Trump White House, according to a former member of the Coronavirus Task Force? Someone inside was creating a parallel set of data and graphics that were shown to the president. Almost exactly one year ago, the first COVID-19 case was confirmed in Canada. Our doctors on what we've learned and on becoming household names. Plus a five-year-old, his homemade Zamboni, and how they caught the attention of the NHL. This is The National. A long-term care home in Barrie, Ontario has become an alarming example of the danger posed by the mutating COVID-19 virus. In just over three weeks, the variant first seen in the UK has infected nearly every resident at Roberta Place, killing more than 40 people. And as Talia Ricci shows us, it may already be in another home. The coronavirus variant first seen in the UK isn't confined to Roberta Place. Another case has been detected in the same region and can be traced back to a COVID-19 outbreak at Bradford Valley Care Community. We are concerned about in this situation is the potential for um, that facility to actually be a UK variant outbreak. We, we need the laboratory confirmation to determine that. The infected individual worked in retail doing curbside pickup. Dr. Gardner says the case was discovered by chance. It appears that uh, at times it's, there's a screening test happening and at times there's not. And I, I would suggest we need to develop that system to be more robust. We have the variants here. Uh, they are spreading. And I think what we need to focus on are things that we can do to prevent it from spreading further. Ontario remains in a province-wide lockdown. Infectious disease experts say this doesn't change what we should be doing on an individual level. We really have to be vigilant in terms of our infection control practices. I'm extremely worried about this. Uh, you know, we've already know how much havoc it's wreaked uh, in the UK. Dr. Kwong wants to see government level measures implemented immediately. Try to reduce the number of people entering the country by, you know, banning uh, non-essential travels. Um, and then and then having a mandatory hotel quarantine so that we're not relying on people to, you know, to use the honor system. Quebec's premier has called on Ottawa to ban vacation travel, citing the threat of COVID-19 variants. Today on Rosemary Barton Live, Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs says these discussions are already happening. All options are on the table. We're very concerned about uh, trying to minimize the importation of COVID-19 or the variants. If you uh, have a trip planned and it's non-essential, cancel it. The message can't be any clearer. That message echoes what our Prime Minister also said this week, noting that includes travel within Canada as well. So, Talia, what happens now at the home with links to, to the new variant? Well, public health officials are now working to determine whether any of the cases at that second home, Bradford Valley Care Community, are connected to the variant. But something positive to note is that most of the residents there have received their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Ian? Thanks, Talia. Let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh now, an infectious disease specialist and a member of Ontario's Vaccine Distribution Task Force. And Dr. Bogosh, so we see variants are making their way into long-term care homes. How concerned should we be? It is concerning. We know that this is transmissible. It's not quite clear how much more transmissible it is, but it likely is more transmissible, and that can cause significant problems as we've seen it unfold in this long-term care facility. There's certainly other long-term care facilities at risk. We really need to double down on our efforts to protect them, to vaccinate those facilities, and, and to really ensure that we can prevent spread in the community. We know the Canadian government is looking at further restrictions on travel. Is that going to be able to, to control the spread of these variants, or are we past uh, the point of no return here? Well, well, they're certainly here. They're certainly here. And curbing travel and some travel restrictions could certainly help, and it might help slow down by uh, slowing down the introduction of more of these variants. But they're already here and they're already being transmitted in the community. So we still need to take uh, the precautions in the community to really prevent spread as much as we can. All right, Dr. Bogosh, we'll see you later in the hour. Thanks. Take care.
The speed and reach of the variant is shocking, but David Common shows us the outbreak at Roberta Place was foreseeable, though not inevitable. And some say more can be done now to protect long-term care residents from any strain of the virus. The alarms about the latest mega outbreak have been clear. Not even two weeks ago, inspectors warned the province that rooms at Roberta Place were being shared by confirmed COVID-19 positive residents and those who weren't, putting them at risk of disease transmission. When the same thing happened elsewhere in the spring, soldiers were brought in to fix it, writing a damning report on conditions inside. Now, outbreaks are at even higher levels province-wide, and deaths on track to soon exceed the first wave. That has some asking what it'll take for Ontario to bring soldiers back to homes. These are mass casualty events. We have never needed the military more than we need them right now. So far, the province has said they're covered with help from hospitals and the Red Cross, but others believe it's about something else. They don't want another military report showing that very little lessons were learned from the first wave. Forty percent of Ontario's homes are in outbreak now, a quarter of the residents dead at Roberta Place. This physician working inside and a former military doctor herself says help is needed. In terms of trying to crisis manage, the military is the best equipped to meet those needs immediately. I do not know to this day why the military has not been deployed. I'm the medical director of four other nursing homes and I'm terrified right now of, you know, where this virus might be in our county and what the next home might be. The province says the virus ripping through Roberta Place is a reminder of the need for everyone to stay home. No mention, though, of calling in the military again. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Reminders of how deadly COVID-19 is to the elderly come so often, it's easy to forget that people of all ages are at risk. Yassine Dabe died last Thursday after contracting the virus. He was just 19. The London, Ontario teen and his family came to Canada as refugees from Syria. Dabe worked for a short period of time as a cleaner at a long-term care home in the London area, where a coronavirus outbreak has been linked to 150 cases and killed at least 14 residents and one staff. The home is also being tested for variants. And COVID-19 restrictions are tightening in the remote Nunavut community of Arviat after it reported another 13 infections today. Schools and non-essential services are now suspended. The small, mostly Inuit hamlet has recorded more than 80% of Nunavut's 280 total cases since the pandemic began. And Ottawa has approved Ontario's request for military help in vaccinating the vast Nishinaabe Aski Nation, spread out in 32 communities across half a million square kilometres. In a tweet, the Public Safety Minister Bill Blair said the government will always be there to support the fight against COVID-19. Canada Post is struggling with a serious COVID-19 outbreak at a major Ontario sorting centre. Mississauga's Gateway facility is still operating, but with a dwindling staff increasingly worried about exposure. And as Brian Stewart tells us, many want to move up in line to get their shots. Since January 1st, at least 190 have tested positive at this Canada Post facility and on Friday, 350 workers on an afternoon shift were sent home and told to isolate. Postal workers have continued to work throughout the pandemic to ensure that small businesses were still able to function and that society could stay home and help to flatten the curve. Um, you know, we feel that we should be prioritized, you know, after the health care workers. And by that she means moving up in the vaccine queue. Well, there's a national consensus around giving the shot to medical workers and long-term care residents first, there is a debate around who should come next. When it comes to the rollout of the vaccine, all provinces have their own schedule. For instance, in Ontario, non-medical frontline workers like those employed in food processing facilities can be vaccinated starting in phase two. While in BC, the earliest they can get the shot is in phase three. Other provinces like Alberta haven't yet released detailed plans. One sector that is also asked to be a priority, meat plants. 
They've been the source of some of the country's largest outbreaks. Canada's Meat Council made the request to the federal government last week. The sense we got was that uh, due consideration would be given. And if it, if it happens, terrific. And if it doesn't happen, then it'll be Q3. Balancing the political pressure must be really hard. This infectious disease modeler says as health officials learn more about the vaccine's effectiveness in reducing transmission, they should reconsider who should be prioritized for shots. We have been relying on throughout the pandemic to keep our postal service, our food supply, our grocery stores, our schools and our economy running, and they're taking a risk. And if essential workers can't get the vaccine any earlier, she says more rapid testing should be rolled out, which Canada Post pledges to do at its Mississauga facility this week. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And there's growing alarm about COVID-19 spread inside Canadian prisons. Authorities are racing to contain outbreaks at facilities across the country before they become dangerous new epicenters. Matt Damore looks at the drive to keep an outbreak near Montreal from spiraling out of control. Behind fences and barbed wire, COVID-19 is raging inside the Saint-Jérôme Detention Centre. A testing campaign started at the jail earlier in the week, at first only in certain sections. But with a rising number of cases, health officials started testing everyone here. So far, out of nearly 300 inmates, 45 tests have come back positive. Those numbers seem really high. And one of the things that we do know is that once the virus is within an institution, it can spread very rapidly. 17 employees have also been infected, with 10 staff members off work for preventative reasons after contacts with positive cases. It's a worrying situation for the union representing Quebec's correctional officers. President Mathieu Lavoie says the network was already uh, facing uh, staffing uh, issues, including in Saint-Jérôme. Given the outbreak's impact on employees, Lavoie says yeah, he's in talks with the public security uh, ministry uh, about bringing in reinforcements. Uh, Ottawa is prioritizing about six 600 federal prisoners in a vaccine rollout plan. They're either elderly or have pre-existing medical conditions. No vaccine has been administered in any of Quebec's provincial detention centres. The John Howard Society says provinces should study the possibility of prioritizing inmates for vaccination. Um, so we think it's very important that prisons not be overlooked uh, when we're looking at how serious the contamination can be and what the consequences of that contamination can be. The testing operation at the Saint-Jérôme Correctional Facility continues. Health authorities tell CBC that all inmates have been tested and the local health authority will continue tests for employees tomorrow. Matt Demo, CBC News, Saint-Jérôme, Quebec. New Zealand's two-month streak without a single case of community transmission has been broken. A woman tested positive and officials aren't taking any chances. We are working on the assumption that uh, this is a positive case and that it is a more transmissible variant. The woman had returned from travel in Europe and tested negative twice during quarantine, but may have caught the virus from another returnee at the quarantine facility. She developed symptoms after leaving isolation and visiting dozens of locations north of Auckland. To the situation in the United States now and a tragic new marker passed today. The U.S. has now surpassed 25 million cases. On average, that's one new infection every 1.2 seconds. And as infections soar, so does the death toll. Nearly 420,000 people have died of COVID in the United States. And as Katie Simpson explains, it's become a desperate race between administering vaccines and containing the spread. New mass vaccination sites are starting to pop up. This one in the parking lot of a stadium will be ready to deliver thousands of doses by next weekend. Plans that can't move fast enough amid fresh warnings of dark days ahead. The, the plane is in a nosedive and we got to pull it up and you're not going to do that overnight. The Biden team is rejecting suggestions. It should increase its vaccination targets now that supply is moving with more predictability. But the administration is sticking with its original goal of 100 million doses delivered during Joe Biden's first 100 days in office. I think it was a reasonable goal that was set. We always want to do better than the goal you've set, but yeah. it is really a floor and not a ceiling. Biden's advisors have accused the Trump administration of leaving no vaccination plan behind, an accusation that's being rejected. 
If I thought that was true, I wouldn't be sleeping right now. In a candid interview, Dr. Deborah Burks admitted she should have spoken out more during her time as the coordinator of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. She also revealed members of President Donald Trump's inner circle believed the virus was a hoax and undermined her using disinformation. I saw the president presenting graphs that I never made. So I know that someone or someone out there or someone inside was creating a parallel set of data and graphics that were shown to the president. So if the COVID response looked chaotic from the outside, Burks confirmed it was the same inside. Every time a, a statement was made by a political leader that wasn't consistent with public health needs, that derailed our response. Dr. Deborah Burks did not directly blame the president's re-election efforts for his COVID response, but she did say the worst time for a pandemic to hit is in an election year. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. This week, the Privy Council office will advise Justin Trudeau on how to go about replacing the governor general. Julie Payette resigned on Thursday after a scathing report described a toxic work environment at Rideau Hall. Ashley Burke is pushing this story forward again tonight. It's quiet today outside Julie Payette's home and Rideau Hall. But behind the scenes, there is urgency. As groundwork is laid to appoint a new governor general, Payette's image and name already stripped from Rideau Hall's website. Her presence on Twitter, gone. It's not a circumstance we want to drag on for weeks and weeks and weeks. There is some urgency to, to have uh, a process in place and make decisions on next steps. Cabinet Minister Dominic LeBlanc told Rosemary Barton Live the government only learned about troubles at Payette's past workplaces through a CBC report. It found Payette had left both the Montreal Science Centre and the Canadian Olympic Committee amid claims she mistreated staff. There was obviously a vetting process that took place, but I don't think we can pretend that it was adequate, and it's being reinforced, obviously, and made more robust. Today, also new details from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, a former astronaut who used to work with Payette. He said the Prime Minister's office did consult him before appointing her to the vice regal role. We were astronauts together, and that uh, she was a very professional astronaut, and in fact, she flew twice representing Canada in space and did a very good job. That was the extent of my input to it. What's happened is very sad, and it points out to the very, very uh, important uh, requirement for us to have respect and dignity in the workplace. We are looking right now at processes that can be strengthened. As Trudeau is now forward. facing renewed uh, criticism. The opposition argues he got swept up in Payette's celebrity status as an astronaut, and he went with his own personal pick, rather than using a nonpartisan advisory committee set up by the Harper government. Why not go back to the advisory council that, that Mr. Harper used? Because that did seem to work. If the measure was the appointment of David Johnston, you're absolutely right. That was clearly a, a very good appointment. Mr. Johnston served extraordinarily well. Um, so I would assume, Rosemary, that that's one of the things that will be considered. So, Ashley, what else will be considered as a new governor general is chosen? Well, Minister LeBlanc said it's always a priority for the government to try to find someone who's Indigenous or diverse for such a high-profile role like this. He's also open to allowing opposition parties to take part in the appointment process, which is something that they have been pushing for. And, and you think about how challenging all of this has been for the employees. They, they start back at work this week with the Chief Justice of Canada in charge. And, and what have you heard about what's being done to help them make that transition? Well, exactly. The, the Privy Council office has said that it's been a very difficult time for workers at Riedel Hall and that the clerk is going to be meeting with staff this week to try to start charting a path forward and restoring the office. All right. Ashley Burke, thank you. Thank you. Tonight, many are mourning the loss of a hockey legend. George Armstrong broke ground for Indigenous players more than 70 years ago. And as captain, he led the Maple Leafs to four Stanley Cup wins. You talk to anybody who played in that team, there's two things. Johnny Bauer's goaltending and George Armstrong's leadership. Armstrong was a quiet sensation. He scored the final goal of the NHL's original six era when Toronto won the 1967 Stanley Cup. That capped off his 21 years with the organization, 12 of them as captain of the Leafs. His mother was Ojibwe and he was nicknamed the Chief. Armstrong played forward and was named one of the 100 greatest Maple Leafs. 
The team retired his number 10, and he's a member of Legends Row. He had a wicked sense of humor. Like, it, 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 he just had an unbelievable sense of humor. It, it, if you're around George Armstrong, it was plain old fun. George Armstrong was 90 years old. Coming up, illegal cannabis candies are making their way into children's hands. Disguised as popular gummies, police say it's difficult to stop their production. We hit one down and, and get rid of it, and four more pop up. Plus, some tragic endings in BC's backcountry as more people look to outdoor adventures amid pandemic restrictions. I think a lot of people are completely naive to the dangers. He's only five, but his driving skills caught the attention of the NHL. We're back in a moment. They look like the kind of candy any kid would love, except they couldn't be any less child-friendly. Pot edibles packaged like candy are illegal, but still they're flooding the market. So Rosa Marcatelli and our Go Public team wanted to know why. Sour Patch Kids. Sour, sweet, gone. One is clearly for kids, the other strictly for adults looking to get high. I got high as but you'd be hard-pressed to tell them apart. They look so alike it's led to major busts in the U.S. Stony Patch Kids. Pediatrician Dr. Jane Pegg couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the packaging of the pot edibles that poisoned a two-year-old boy. When he came into the emergency, he was unconscious and having trouble breathing. His mom had accidentally given him these pot gummies, thinking they were kids' sour candy. They belonged to the toddler's grandfather. I don't know why the companies that are selling these products are not being shut down. In some cases, like the one involving the two-year-old, caregivers unknowingly gave the kids the pot-laced gummies or chocolate. In others, the kids found them around the house. Edibles have been legal since October 2019, but the look-alike packages are not. It's illegal to sell pot that's packaged with images or bright colors that appeal to children and aren't child-resistant. Peg tried to report what she was seeing, but says Health Canada ignored her email until Go Public asked why. The health agency says it was sent to a generic email address that gets quite busy, so a response was delayed. When it did reply months later, it told her she could contact police. But shutting down these websites that sell the problematic pot packaging isn't that easy, says this police chief. Whack-a-mole kind of describes it quite well when we, 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 we hit one down and, and get rid of it and four more pop up. Regional poison centers report hundreds of unintentional poisonings involving kids and all edibles across the country. In some areas, the numbers have doubled over the past year. The federal government announced an action plan 10 months ago to crack down on illegal products, but it hasn't been put into action yet. Part of the delay may be figuring out who will pay for it, says this lawyer. I think there is a certain amount of um kind of jurisdictional struggle over whose responsibility really is this. Meanwhile, the illegal packages continue to be sold online and end up in the wrong young hands. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. Our Go Public stories come from you, so if you have a tip to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. As public health efforts focus on COVID-19, it may be at the expense of another crisis, the opioid epidemic. Now a community in northern Ontario is sounding the alarm in a very public and personal way. Sarah McMillan shows us how. It all started with a single cross. 22-year-old Miles Keeney died in September of an accidental overdose, just a few blocks from this site in downtown Sudbury. We started with some flowers and then eventually we just decided to put a cross. Denise Sandal says that cross was to honour her son and to raise awareness about how hard the opioid crisis has hit this city. She invited other victims' families to add crosses of their own. Within weeks, they were going up by the dozens. There are now more than 150. These are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, you know, um, daughters and sons that are loved and missed and mourned by the families. Kayla Birch visits often. Her mother died of a fentanyl overdose in November, but she also recognizes many other names. When I used to do drugs, I'd hang out down here a lot with a lot of the people, and everyone I know is pretty much gone now. In 2020, there were at least 83 fatal overdoses in Sudbury, up from 56 the year before. 
Grieving families say they hope this display will spark much needed change, including more rehabilitation services. This outreach worker is pushing for a supervised consumption site in the city, along with a safe drug supply program. Our numbers are going up and I don't see that changing anytime soon when you look at how toxic the drug supply is. City officials say they want to do more, but need additional funding from the province. Um, you know, we need help right now. Um, all the focus is on uh, COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, you can see with the number of crosses, uh, we, we have significant challenges here in, in Sudbury and uh, northern Ontario and across Canada. So far, the Ontario government hasn't made any new promises. I worry about how many more families are going to suffer this loss and how many more we are going to lose. And this field of heartbreak will almost certainly grow unless drastic action is taken soon. Sarah McMillan, CBC News, Sudbury. Tomorrow marks one year since the first case of coronavirus was identified on Canadian soil. So much changed for our doctors that day. I speak with two of them about the last 12 months. Plus. People and businesses are really scared right now. We check in with three small business owners on surviving the economic uncertainty. One year ago, the coronavirus was largely a mystery. China says the virus's ability to spread is strengthening. That sounds dire. What does it mean? It's unclear exactly what they mean by that. That was last January, one day after learning of Canada's very first case. Since then, infectious disease doctors have spent hours answering our calls and answering your questions. Some have become household names, from Dr. Isaac Bulgosh in Toronto to Dr. Lenora Saxinger in Edmonton. We really have to up our game in terms of the prevention of transmission in the community. A year after the first case was confirmed in Canada, we want to chat with them about what we've learned and how the pandemic has changed their lives. Welcome to, to both of you and, and Dr. Bogosh, who knew when we had that first chat so long ago that, that I would keep seeing you over and over and over again. How, how did you decide to take such a public role in talking about COVID? Well, it's very interesting in that uh, obviously this this has impacted Canada and the world and there were so many questions and quite frankly we're in an era where there's a lot of misinformation amplified online and it's, it is wonderful being part of a, a much larger team of uh, healthcare providers and scientists that, that really helps uh, the general public understand this a little bit better. And Dr. Saxinger, you've answered every one of our calls. Was it difficult at all to making the decision to, to be so public about COVID? I mean, clearly there are some downsides to putting yourself out there. You do get some feedback and I've learned never to read the comments, but <laughs> I actually do agree that, you know, there's a sense making function that's important. And when people are under stress and there's information coming fast and furious, it becomes even more important. And I think that's evolved over time. Now it's more like trying to help people understand why there's differences of opinion. Um, and, and it's become a very interesting landscape um, as time has gone by. Yeah, and, and so, Dr. Saxinger, I, well, I follow both of you guys on Twitter, but, but Dr. Saxinger, I remember at one point you wrote how you're very reluctant to make public comments about masking because it's so controversial. You just mentioned you've stayed away from, from the comments on Twitter. What, what kind of feedback, though, are you getting sort of in your day-to-day -day life? You know, it's interesting because um, I guess I now realize how many people watch the news because <laughs> I feel like people feel like they know me. Um, and I've had quite a lot of really nice interchanges with people who are just saying thank you for the information, thank you for presenting in a way that I find easier to understand. And um, that, that's been actually very valuable to me and hearing what people really, how they react to things, I think has been really useful to me as a communicator as well. And Dr. Bogosh, same thing. First of all, both of you guys are your doctors, your parents, your spouses. I don't know if you have time to lead a normal life, Dr. Bogosh, but if you are at the supermarket, do people tap you on the shoulder there? Yeah, I mean, I think I've had a similar experience as Dr. Saxinger as well. You get the odd nod, the odd smile, the odd uh, very, very kind comment. And it's it's wonderful to see. Uh, but full transparency, uh, I mean, since the pandemic really started in Canada, at least in, in March, I mean, I haven't led much of a life and had many opportunities to have social interactions. I sort of live between the house and the hospital. But when I do venture out, which is unfortunately rarely, uh, it's very nice to see the odd, very positive comment here and there. 
One of the things about our knowledge of coronavirus is that it is evolving. And one of the things I appreciate with both of you and your colleagues is that you are willing to speak publicly, even though you know that what you say today may not uh, represent kind of the state of science in a month's time. I want to ask you both this, but Dr. Saxinger, I'll start with you. Has anything kind of stood out or surprised you about the way our knowledge of coronavirus has, has evolved? Well, I think the thing that um, has become more and more clear is that, you know, there's early signals that this virus could be transmitted very easily and very early in people with very minimal or no symptoms. And I think it's more often minimal symptoms, though. And how that's manifested has really been fascinating because it tells us where people are interacting in society and where they don't have a choice um, in terms of, you know, avoiding certain types of interaction. And to me, that's it's illustrating a lot about our societal function that I think we can learn a lot from, uh, especially if we want to prevent things like this from happening in the future. And Dr. Bogosh, what's struck you as, as our knowledge has changed in the last year? You know, what's interesting is when we chatted about a year ago, we were talking about fever, cough, and shortness of breath as the symptoms. But as we learn more and more about this virus and have a much better understanding of the true clinical manifestations of it, we clearly see that it's much more broad than that and, and you know some very interesting signs and symptoms like loss of smell and taste like, that's kind of bizarre and i don't think anyone would have predicted that from uh, early on so there's been some really interesting uh clinical manifestations that we found from this uh, from this infection i find fascinating that just evolved over time we could all use some optimism, particularly some informed optimism. So here's my challenge for both of you within 30 seconds each, starting with Dr. Saxinger. Uh, is there cause for optimism? Absolutely. I mean, we've learned a lot. This is a chess game. It's not a single battle. And um, the fact that we already have really good vaccines is incredible. We just have to deploy them right and make the right moves over the next several months. But I really think that we're moving into an endgame stage and that we'll be able to plan for the future better. Dr. Bogosh? I'm completely in agreement with Dr. Saxinger. We're in the vaccine era. There uh, obviously is uh, you know, a shortage of these vaccines right now, but as we move into second quarter and we watch this vaccine program massively expand, I think we're gonna to start to see some real significant benefits that actually manifest into a positive change in our lives in terms of how we live. And I don't think we're gonna go back to 2019 like that, but we're gonna start moving along that spectrum rather quickly as we move uh, into the spring and summer. Have you guys ever met each other, by the way? Not in just person. On this I just see you here. Venue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hopefully post, I, I keep thinking, hopefully post pandemic, there'll be a big infectious disease doctor party and I can be there and we can sort of have everybody chatting in the same room. But for now, thanks for sharing a screen. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Well, until this crisis ends, many people across the country fear their livelihoods may disappear before the virus does. In tonight's Pandemic Diaries, we catch up with Canadian small business owners to hear their stories of struggle and even unexpected success. My name is Marika Gao. My fiancé, John, and I live in the town of Trinity, Newfoundland. We run my family's business, the Artisan Inn and Twine Loft Restaurant. Last year, Marika's businesses, like so many others, were facing the possibility of not being able to reopen until 2021. We need to start making income. People and businesses are really scared right now. Hello there, uh, this is Ryan Kennedy. I'm of the Fighting Arts Collective here in Toronto. COVID-19 meant Ryan was unable to pay the rent for the martial arts gym that he ran for 15 years. i show you the training hall. That forced him to close down. It's a really sad time, of course. I, you know, we just had to, had to do what we had to do. Hi, my name is Vanessa Smithers, and I'm a career coach, youth engagement strategist, and writer. Are overnight something that you're open to? Vanessa's job gave her some insight into how the pandemic was affecting others. Most days I'm waking up to around 20 to 30 emails from potential clients requesting anything to get them into the job force. Welcome back to all three of you. And Marika, let me, let me start with you. How are you doing? We're doing okay. We're in our off season right now and we made it through the 2020 tourism season, uh, which felt really great. Uh, right now I'm spending my time just planning for how we're gonna tackle the 2021 season. And, and it's an interesting situation in Newfoundland and Labrador because on the one hand, you have very few COVID cases, but on the other hand, you have a travel ban. 
Yeah, we're really fortunate to be living in one of the safest places to be in Canada right now. Uh, and that is a result of the travel ban that's in place. Uh, but it's tough too, because as a tourism operator, people want to start booking now. And we first have the hurdle of the Newfoundland travel ban to get over. And Ryan, your business has been shut down as well, but uh, at least the physical premises uh, permanently. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, we were affected pretty early on in the... Uh, in the situation, uh, but we've, you know, had to change the way we do things with uh, outdoor classes. I've been really missing, uh, you know, having training partners. And Zoom meetings, so it's a big change from what I'm used to, of course, and there's a lot of uh, learning curve to figuring out how to do that well. But uh, we're still, yeah, we're still kicking and we're still here. Hey, you seem to be in pretty good spirits, at least right now. How, how are you doing generally? Uh, pretty good, I would say. Uh, things were pretty grim <laughs> back then. A lot was going on in my mind, I'm sure. Uh, so we've adapted to uh, lifestyle changes and uh, you know how to go about doing, <clears throat> you know, doing our, our our passion here, and that has been a challenge as the regulations around gatherings and so on have have changed so much. Uh, since last we talked to. So that's been a huge challenge, just trying to get any sort of sense of continuancy, if mm -hmm. that's uh, the right way to put it, but to try to keep keep things rolling has been really the hardest. Uh, but Yeah. And Vanessa, what about you? Uh, I'm actually staying pretty busy. When we first spoke, I was working for myself in a full-time capacity as a career coach. Um, since the pandemic, jobs have started to slow down and individuals and their finances haven't been as... Um, I guess high as they might have been before. Um, so with that being said, I've had to look for a job and I've also been able to start a clothing line, which has been going pretty well. Yeah, you just slid that in so casually. I started a <laughs> clothing line. How's that going? Yeah. The clothing line is awesome. Um, it was just like a very spontaneous start. I had never designed clothes in my life, um, but given the pandemic, it sparked my creativity and um, it's going well. So just tell me if we were to speak in six months time, and I hope we do, uh, where do you think you'll be? Where do you hope you'll be? Marika, beginning with you. I definitely know that we're going to be well into running our 2021 season. Uh, the question is going to be whether or not we're uh, hosting residential tourists only or if we're going to be welcoming the rest of Canada and the world. Ryan? Yeah, I would love to be uh, back in business too and doing what we all love to do. Um, you know, in, in my business, it's, uh, it's a way of life, not just, uh, not just a hobby that we do on Tuesdays. So. And Vanessa? Uh, I'm hoping that my career coaching roster picks up again and I'm able to work a full-time capacity uh, within my own business. I think it's going to be better in six months, and I look forward to talking to you guys one more time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. If you're thinking about heading into the backcountry, search and rescue teams are warning about the dangers. People are trying to find different locations to go to, and so what they're doing is finding trails that are unusual or less, less marked. More people are finding themselves in unfamiliar territory and then in trouble. Plus, <laughs> the smallest Zamboni and the smallest Zamboni driver, at least that we've seen. Stay with us. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, defeated, betrayed, or determined. The conspiratorial world of QAnon is in turmoil after Donald Trump's defeat. Is this the end? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. During this pandemic, stifling lockdowns have led some Canadians to push the limits of outdoor safety. This weekend at Banff National Park, four skaters fell through the ice. A woman in her 20s was in the water for 30 minutes and was treated for hypothermia. As more people head into the wilderness for recreation, BC's search and rescue teams are fielding a record number of emergency calls. And the threat of COVID makes these rescues much more complicated. Greg Rasmussen shows us the toll that's taking. Preparing for the unknown. A young woman has been missing for 16 hours. About 50 rescue volunteers have set aside family and work to help in a desperate search in the mountains near West Vancouver. A nurse and two other rescuers ascend to be dropped into a remote location. She told her boyfriend that she had lost her way at 3.30 yesterday. Uh, rather than phoning, she did not phone 911. 
we're definitely concerned. She is off the east side of the ridge. Yeah. They just spotted her, so... Yeah, um, that, so. Yeah. Okay. At the search headquarters, spotters in a helicopter radio in. They had just located 21-year-old Nikki Donnelly in a steep gully, but she's not moving. They'll have to do an aerial extraction. She's in steep, inaccessible terrain where a helicopter can't land. She posted video on social media from her solo hike, but then she ran into trouble, got lost, and her cell phone failed. By the time the crew reaches her, it's too late. She's dead. I want to pull them away from this cliff. In the past year, search and rescue crews in BC have responded to about 1,900 calls, a new record. A surge linked to more people spending more time in BC's backcountry. The busiest rescue team, which saw calls double in the past 12 months, is based in North Vancouver. We attribute that to social media, to the amount of people that are on the trails and people wanting to kind of enjoy that experience on their own. But in doing so, they're getting into more technical terrain and they're losing that cell signal as well. Roger. In addition to many more calls, rescues are complicated by COVID precautions. For example, rescues like this one last year near Squamish show how people have to be in close proximity, sometimes for hours in small spaces like helicopters. Missions often involve dozens of searchers and can take days or weeks. The all-volunteer crews now face additional COVID-related health worries. At any one time, multiple tasks can be underway in the province, such as this search earlier this month on Vancouver Island for a missing kayaker who might have ended up stranded on shore. Uh, I'm on trail forks now. Another location, another call out. This time, a search for a man believed to be somewhere in the hills of a Vancouver suburb. People are trying to find different locations to go to, and so what they're doing is finding trails that are unusual or less, less marked. The complication with that is that these trails have less infrastructure, there's less trail marking, and they're not that as well known in, a, in guidebooks or online uh, reports on how to find and access them. Every year, officials plead with people to take greater precautions, but many ignore that advice and continue to do things like ski out of bounds. The snow is just so deep and I was so exhausted. Just over a year ago, Mark Gajowski was lost in the snow for nearly three days in an out of bounds area near a ski hill. Since being rescued, he's become an advocate for being better prepared. Best thing to do is stay in one spot because people are going to be looking for you. Have the proper gear for sure. I've got hand warmers just in case. I've got some Tylenol mittens. For some, that message is sinking in. I take it seriously because I don't want to be one of these people stuck up here. Such as these people out for a day hike. Take five minutes to do some preparation and I think it'll be really worth it and maybe save your life. But there are fears others haven't learned the lesson. We anticipate things are going to ramp up even more and that's really concerning for us because I think a lot of people are completely naive to the dangers. For the would-be rescuers on Cypress Mountain, it's an emotional end to a tough day as they fly out with Nikki Donnelly's body. A reminder that this inviting landscape can quickly become unforgiving. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, North Vancouver. Coming up, the young Zamboni driver who caught the NHL's attention. How the New Brunswick hockey player is reacting to his shout out by the big league. But first, YouTube star Jojo Siwa came out last week. The 17-year-old dancer, singer and actress spoke to her followers this weekend about being part of the LGBTQ community. Yesterday I posted me in the shirt and the day before that, I posted the TikTok. So it's been 48 hours of the world knowing. Personally, I have never, ever, ever been this happy before. And it's just so, so, so awesome. I'm the happiest that I've ever been. And that's what matters. Five-year-old Nicola Alain might just have the sweetest setup this winter. His dad built him a custom rink so he wouldn't miss this entire season of playing hockey because of COVID. And the rink even has, as you can see, sponsor boards. 
Well, Nicholas Rink and his Zamboni driving skills caught the eye of the NHL, who reposted the video of the young man on their Instagram. And all of this is our moment. He's still fairly young to, to make a, a big deal. And, and, but he, he wanted to see it and uh, see the see how they formatted on the on the NHL and he, he ran to his mother and he, he thought it was pretty cool. Fun. He thought it was fun, yeah. He really yeah. thought it was fun and cool. He wants to play in the NHL for the Vegas Knights. Wait, I did my own little Zamboni with a piece of ABS pipe and uh, fittings and uh, a real Zamboni sock in the back or whatever just to, to put everything level. And so I had, I had extra parts laying around and, and I seen this gator in the garage, uh, side by side we call. And I said, geez, I could just use that old old uh, piece of bin that we have and, and a few fittings and stuff that I already have. I just bought a, I just had to buy uh, basically the valve and it went like that. So on a Friday night, a few pops in the garage and, uh, you know, a couple of studs in the tire and, uh, you know, the next morning he, he rode it. So I did, I did a little video. I thought it was pretty cool. So that one shot there with the dad, it has kind of a field of, uh, dreams vibe half expect to see legendary hockey players come on to the ice 575,000 views that video got on Instagram I can only dream of posting a video to get that much exposure and if you're thinking about maybe building your own mini Zamboni we saw what you need a small you know yard tractor I guess and a bucket and studded tires and actually two more things a yard and cold weather so pretty well rules out most of us here in Vancouver that is a national for January 24th. Good night.